good afternoon everyone and welcome to today's session as usual we going to start in 5 minutes so that people can join in okay we can start our today's uh, session so as we are uh, going through a revision of the protein part this is the remaining part of our protein discussion so the uh, we ended our discussion in the last class on transmembrane transport and transmembrane protein right so the overview of transmembrane transport says that cellular membranes regulate the traffic of molecules and ions into and out of cells and their organs the rate of simple diffusion of a substance across a membrane is proportional to its concentration gradient and hydrophobicity with the exception of gases and small uncharged water soluble molecules most molecules cannot diffuse across a pure phospholipid bilayer at rates sufficient to meet cellular needs we have already discussed these points right 
Membrane transport proteins provide a hydrophilic passageway for molecules and ions to travel through the hydrophobic interior of a membrane. Three classes of transmembrane protein mediate transport of ions, sugars, amino acids and other metabolites across cellular membranes, channels, transporters and ATP powered pumps. Channels form a hydrophilic tube through which water ions uh, water or ions move down a concentration gradient, a process known as facilitated transport. So if we look at the typical uh, concentration of ions across the cell membrane, we can see that if we are talking about uh, invertebrates and vertebrates, though the numbers are different, but if we take the overall uh, notion that which ion is more and at which side, the uh, overall polarity of a cell or the concentration of ions across the membrane remains same. For example, if you look at the mammalian cell in the below part of the table and the uh, invertebrate axon in the top part of the uh, table, we can clearly see that potassium though inside cell it is 400 millimolar, in blood it is 20 millimolar, in mammalian it is 139 millimolar and it is only 4 millimolar in the blood. But you can see potassium is more in cell and less in blood. Similarly more in cell less in blood. Uh, if we go for second ion that is sodium we can see 50 in cell and 440 in blood similarly 12 in cell within the cell and 145 in blood this indicates that sodium is less inside the cell and more in outside the cell similarly for invertebrates also so this trend can be easily learned that which ion is more and which ion is less not necessary the concentration though it will be nice if you guys can remember the concentration of some uh, important ions such as sodium potassium chlorine calcium right all these things or maybe just in a way uh, that sodium is more outside the cell potassium is more inside the cell calcium is more outside the cell right chlorine is more outside the cell like this then we talked about these two really good membrane transporters which are actually regulating our whole system of how we uh, are actually sensing and doing the thinking process right because at the end of the day all the neuronal action whatever we are having the synapses and all this is all happening because of the stimulus which leads to the change in the electronic configuration or the uh, difference in the elect uh, this uh, distribution of the ions okay so let me share the screen with you guys just a minute in this video we're going to talk about the sodium potassium pump so in red is the cell membrane below that is the intracellular fluid which is basically inside of the cell and outside of that we have the extracellular fluid or the outside part of the cell now the concentration of sodium ions outside of the cell is very high The cell tries to keep the concentration of sodium ions low inside of the cell. And the reverse is true for potassium. The concentration of potassium outside the cell is low, but the cell tries to maintain a high internal potassium concentration. So make sure you understand that. So the concentration of sodium ions in the cell is low, but the concentration of potassium ions inside the cell is high with respect to the extracellular fluid. Now, the first thing that happens in the sodium potassium pump is that three sodium ions will enter the pump. In addition, energy is needed. So ATP is going to convert to ADP and it's going to phosphorylate the pump. It's going to activate it. So it's going to transfer a phosphate group in the process. So right now we're going to have three sodium ions 
and the phosphate group. Now once the sodium ions enter, as well as the phosphate group, the protein changes shape. On the bottom, it closes. On the top, it's going to open, giving us the shape that we see here. Now in the next step, the pump is going to lose affinity for the sodium ions. So the three sodium ions are going to leave. And this is gonna maintain a high external concentration of sodium ions. Now, as the three sodium ions leave, two potassium ions will enter the pump. And I'm gonna highlight that in purple. So here are the two potassium ions. And we still have a phosphate group. Now, the protein is going to lose affinity for the phosphate group at this point. So the phosphate group leaves, and then it undergoes a conformational change. It's, the shape is gonna change once more. So at the top of the protein pump, it's going to close, and at the bottom, it's going to open. So right now, what we have are two potassium ions in the pump. Now, after the protein pump changes shape, it's going to lose affinity for the potassium ions, causing the potassium ions to leave. And so they're gonna maintain a high concentration inside the cell. At this point, the process is going to repeat itself. So the sodium ions that are inside of the cell, three of them are going to go back into the sodium potassium pump. And the phosphate group, which will come from ATP, will re-enter the pump as well, repeating the entire cycle. So that's how the sodium potassium pump works. So let's summarize what we've learned. As we said before, the... And the other one, which is an important aspect of membrane protein transportation. Five days. You give me five days and I'll... the sodium channel is permeable to sodium but not chloride and why the potassium channel is permeable to potassium but not to sodium in this video we will discuss the selective permeability of protein channels a brief answer is that the ion selectivity results from characteristic features of the inside surface of the channel that makes the pore these properties are diameter and shape of the pore and electrical charges and chemical bonds along the inside surface. These characteristics of the channel determine which ion can pass through and which cannot. Now before we see an example of any channel, you need to understand how a dissolved ion interacts with water molecules. So let's see that very quickly. This is a water molecule. In water molecule, we have one oxygen and two hydrogen atoms. The electron pair in between the oxygen and hydrogen is pulled more strongly by oxygen. So it lies more close to the oxygen than hydrogen. This gives the oxygen a partial negative charge and hydrogen atoms a partial positive charge. Because of this, an oxygen atom of one water molecule and a hydrogen atom of another are attracted to each other. This bond is called a hydrogen bond. Multiple such bonds can be seen around one water molecule. Now, this bond is not so strong. In the liquid state of water, the water molecules are continuously in random motion. As they move, such hydrogen bonds keep forming and breaking with nearby water molecules. Now let's say we have dissolved a positively charged ion in the water. Here also, the negative charge on the oxygen atom of water gets attracted to this positive charge. Thus, a charged ion does not exist totally free. Rather, it's bound to water molecules surrounding it. And remember, these bonds also keep shifting 
from one water molecule to another as they all keep moving in a liquid state. If all this is clear to you, we can now see why the sodium channels are highly selective for sodium ions only. This is a sodium channel. Its inner surface is lined with negatively charged amino acids. In the surrounding fluid, we have a sodium ion with water molecules weakly bound to it. During its random movement, let's say it comes close to this channel at some point in time. Now, the negative charge on the inside of the channel pulls the positively charged sodium ion into the channel. So its bonds with water molecules break and free sodium ion enters the channel. From here, it can cross the channel. On the other side, it again binds with the water molecules located over there. Thus, the sodium channel allows the passage of sodium. If a negatively charged ion, for example chloride, comes close to it, it's simply repelled by the negative charge of the channel. So negatively charged ions cannot cross the sodium channel. But what about other positively charged ions like potassium and calcium? Well, I guess they are simply too large to fit into the channel. So they also cannot pass through the sodium channel. So this is why sodium channels are highly selective for the passage of sodium ions. Now if you are intelligent, you might ask, if sodium ions are smaller than potassium, why don't they also diffuse through the potassium channel? Let me give you the answer. Near the outer side of the potassium channel, the pore region has carbonyl oxygens. Let's say a potassium ion, with all its surrounding water molecules, has come close to it. We earlier saw that hydrogen bonds keep shifting from molecule to molecule as the ions move freely in the liquid state of water. Similarly here also, the bonding of potassium ion can shift from water molecule to carbonyl oxygen. The key point here is the distance between the potassium ion and the carbonyl oxygen. Because the potassium ion is large, it reaches the carbonyl oxygen very closely. This distance is almost equal to its distance from the oxygen atom of a water molecule. So it's very easy for the bonds to shift from water to the carbonyl oxygen. And as it happens, the surrounding water leaves the potassium ion. Now this plain potassium ion can enter and therefore cross the channel. Now what if a sodium ion comes nearby? The sodium ion is smaller in size. So relative to its distance from oxygen of water, its distance from carbonyl oxygen of channel is very long. So the sodium ion cannot interact with the carbonyl oxygen. And therefore, it cannot get rid of the water molecules bound to it. Such an ion with water molecules bound to it cannot fit into the channel and therefore cannot cross it. Because of these properties of the potassium channel, the potassium channel is 1000 times more permeable to potassium than sodium, even though sodium is a smaller ion. So this is all about the selective permeability of channels. Please note that I have explained concepts in a simplified and schematic way. Selectivity to other ions like calcium, chloride, etc. are also determined by such intricacy basically our membrane protein uh, classifications and what different types of proteins are there what function do they do and then we asked ourselves a question that okay the proteins are there in the membrane and they are the ones who are providing the functionality to the membrane but how do they actually go to the membrane right how are they assembled in the membrane or how because everything protein synthesis from our basic uh, uh, cell biology lectures we know that protein synthesis takes place in the cytoplasm it doesn't take place in the membrane right cell membrane 
so our question was okay we understand that there are lot of functions which are associated with uh, membrane proteins they are the ones who are doing signaling transduction they are the ones who are transporting ions they are the ones who are acting as biomarkers they are the ones who are uh, uh, anchoring the cell to the surrounding right all these things but how do they actually reach there so from there we took our discussion towards the endocytic pathway or the protein secretory uh, pathway right and then we discussed about cell uh, how the cell sort the proteins which are synthesized in the cytoplasm how the cell knows that this is the protein which needs to go to the membrane and the other protein which is synthesized is the one which doesn't need to go to the membrane so there we had a discussion about signal peptides and the role of golgi body the role of endoplasmic reticulum right so to give a brief about it you guys must remember this but it's just a how membrane and secretory okay? proteins are synthesized in the endoplasmic reticulum let's begin with a question for concept clarity we know that rer is the site of membrane and secretory protein synthesis and it has ribosomes attached to the outer surface as you see here but the question is are ribosomes permanently attached to the rough endoplasmic reticulum actually the ribosomes of the rer are not permanently attached to the membrane they constantly attach and detach to the membrane as needed for protein synthesis translation of secretory or integral membrane proteins initiates in the cytosol then ribosomes containing these mrnas are recruited to the er membrane and fuses with the membrane and finally releases a polypeptide to the er lumen let us divide the entire process into simple steps for better understanding step 1 as you see this is a mrna that comes out of the nuclear pore into the cytosol or the cytoplasm then the ribosomes step 1 is ribosomes and the brain is not here mrna that is a subunit oh you guys cannot see it no man this brain oh, is not okay, here i'm so sorry about that let me do it again uh can you see it now yes okay and also let me know whether you can hear the uh, voice over huh? and how membrane and secretory proteins are synthesized in the endoplasmic reticulum let's begin with a no question man, the question okay what about now understand how membrane and secretory proteins are synthesized in the endoplasmic reticulum let's begin with a question for concept clarity we know that rer is the site of membrane and secretory protein synthesis and it has ribosomes attached to the outer surface as you see here but the question is are ribosomes permanently attached to the rough endoplasmic reticulum actually the ribosomes of the rer are not permanently attached to the membrane they constantly attach and detach to the membrane as needed for protein synthesis translation of secretory or integral membrane proteins initiates in the cytosol then ribosomes containing these mrnas are recruited to the er membrane and fuses with the membrane and finally releases a polypeptide to the er lumen let us divide the entire process into simple steps for better understanding step 1 as you see this is a mrna that comes out of the nuclear pore into the cytosol or the cytoplasm then the ribosomes step 1 is ribosomes assembles on mrna larger subunit and smaller subunit of ribosomes binds to the mrna step 2 is signal sequence synthesis in the amino acid terminus of nascent polypeptide so this ribosome starts synthesizing a signal sequence which is a hydrophobic amino acid sequence of 18 to 30 residues that is recognized by signal recognition particle which is a protein so step 2 you can see this ribosome starts in the sensing signal peptide 
in step three you can see there are many free signal recognition particles that is present in the cytoplasm it recognizes and binds to the nascent polypeptide ribosome complex so this is a complex and this signal recognition particle binds to the complex or ribosome polypeptide complex and inhibits further translation so protein synthesis is stopped then this SRP or signal recognition particle is an RNA protein complex that is abundant in cytosol a universally conserved ribonucleoprotein that recognizes and targets specific proteins to the endoplasmic reticulum in eukaryotes and in prokaryotes it targets to the plasma membrane then step four is SRP then targets this ender complex as you see it is made up of ribosome a nascent chain complex a polypeptide with the signal peptide and that is bounded by SRP to the protein conducting channel that is located on the ER which is called as translocone ER membrane as you see this is the translocone this occurs via the interaction and docking or binding of SRP with its receptor there is an SRP receptor that is located on ER membrane SRP binds to this receptor step 5 upon docking or upon binding the nascent polypeptide chain is inserted into the translocon channel as you see here where it enters into the ER then protein synthesis resumes as SRP is released from the ribosome step 6 once inside the ER the signal sequence is removed from the core protein by an enzyme called signal peptidase this ensuring that signal sequence are not included or not there as part of the mature protein step 7 the SRP SRP receptor complex dissociates via GTP hydrolysis and the cycle of SRP mediated protein translocation to the ER membrane continues so once inside the lumen following protein synthesis and translocation inside the ER lumen a protein that is destined for secretion undergoes proper folding and modifications with the help of chaperones and folding enzymes modifications include disulfide bond formation and initial glycosylation and finally the folded processed protein is packaged in vesicles to Golgi apparatus and further modified there processed there within the Golgi and secreted out of the cell by exocytosis for more details you can refer our video on endomembrane system where we discuss both the pathway the secretory pathway and also the pathway that is where lysosome is involved so these are the steps involved in the synthesis of This was the why I, if you guys remember, I actually put a lot of time in discussing this because these were the preliminary discoveries in the field of cell biology and membrane biology indirectly because then only we come, we came to know that how proteins are transferred within the cell and how they are assimilated inside the membrane. Right? So these were some seminal uh, work which was done in this field and a lot of Nobel Prizes were also awarded. In this slide we actually discussed that there is a membrane asymmetry associated with the membrane right? and that asymmetry came from both, it still comes from both protein and the uh, lipid part of a membrane. So the inside or the inner leaflet of a bilayer is different from the outside lipid or the outside leaflet of a bilayer similarly if the organelles are inside their outside membrane will be different and their inside or their lumen facing membrane will be different okay and this is a very important figure it actually gives you an idea about the types of transportations which are occurring from surface to the cell and within the cell also
ओके देन वी टॉक अबाउट हाउ वी एक्चुअली नो दैट मेम्ब्रेन्स हैव प्रोटीन्स एंड इट इज फ्लूड फ्लूडिक इन नेचर द मेम्ब्रेन इज फ्लूडिक इन नेचर सो द एक्सपेरिमेंट वॉज बेसिकली मिक्सिंग टू डिफरेंट टाइप्स ऑफ सेल हैविंग टू डिफरेंट आइडेंटिफायर्स सो इफ यू मिक्स द सेल आफ्टर अ सर्टेन पॉइंट जस्ट आफ्टर मिक्सिंग दैम दे विल बी क्लियर डिस्टिंगशन बिटवीन दीज टू डिफरेंट टाइप्स ऑफ सेल्स राइट बट इफ द मेमरी इज नॉट फ्लूडिक इवन आफ्टर पर्टिकुलर अमाउंट ऑफ टाइम से हेयर फोर्टी मिनट्स इट विल इट शुड रिमेन डिस्टिंगटिवली पॉसिबल टू ट्रेस विच हाफ ऑफ द सेल इज कमिंग फ्रॉम विच हाफ राइट बट आफ्टर फोर्टी मिनट्स एज यू कैन सी इन द रिप्रेजेंटेटिव फिगर इट सेल दैट वी विल नॉट बी एबल टू डिस्टिंग्विश दैट which half belongs to which part of the cell because as the membrane is fluidic in nature all the proteins and the identifiers will mix within themselves leading to the hybrid system okay another experiment which actually helped us in understanding that membrane is actually fluidic in nature was the frap that is fluorescence recovery after photo bleaching so as the name suggests it's pretty easy we will put fluorophores on the membrane with the help of a laser we will try to bleach a particular area that there is no uh, fluorescence detected from that part after few ta- after a few minutes if we look at that uh, space again where we have photo bleached we can see that there is recovery or there is detection of signal light signal right it indicates that the membrane are fluidic in nature another experiment was flip that is fluorescence loss in photo bleaching it is similar because if from somewhere the photo bleaching effect has been nullified so it must be coming from the nearby place right so ideally speaking from that nearby place the signal should reduce and exactly this is what ob- what was observed right so then we uh, actually discussed about how uh, these small molecules or proteins or lipids that transported across the membrane because we are till now we were talking about the transportation within the cell there are rep- certain reports which actually tells you that proteins and small rna molecules they are also transported from one cell to another cell via vesicles only right so this was the brief uh, overview of the whole uh, eukaryotic pathway which is called protein sorting pathway why we are calling it protein sorting pathway because when once the protein is synthesized the system of the cell decides which protein goes to the membrane and which protein stays in the cytosol and this is done by signal peptides right which will be coded by the mrna correct and that mrna will be coded by the gene so at the end of the day the gene which have the proteins coding for the membrane protein they have a particular region in them which will code for a signal peptide right this makes sense right because for a system to know for for the system there is nothing called membrane or non membrane part it is for us to understand right so how does a membrane or the system knows that this protein needs to go to the membrane and not it's a it's via a special signal which is associated with the protein when it is translated correct so we gonna look at this i have skipped the ad hopefully yeah and how transmembrane proteins import into the er and embed themselves in the er bilayer to begin start a table to learn the two types of proteins that enter the er to note that there are water soluble proteins and transmembrane proteins which add to the er's phospholipid bilayer both types have signal sequences that direct them to the er here we'll focus only on transmembrane proteins which import co-translationally ribosomes continue synthesizing them as they cross the membrane to begin return to our table to learn the different types of membrane proteins do note that they include the following type 1 membrane proteins which have a signal sequence at their end terminus and an internal stop transfer sequence type 2 membrane proteins which have an internal signal sequence instead of a terminal one type 3 which also have an internal signal sequence instead of a terminal one will distinguish them from type 2 proteins shortly 
Type 4, which are multi-pass membrane proteins that have multiple hydrophobic regions embedded in the bilayer, will focus on a two-pass protein which has an internal signal sequence and a stop transfer sequence. We'll illustrate how each of these proteins inserts into the membrane. Let's start with type 1 membrane proteins. First draw an ER membrane with a translocon and a membrane-bound signal peptidase. The translocon is a channel through which proteins enter the ER lumen. Label the cytosolic and luminal sides of the membrane. Next draw a ribosome bound to the cytosolic side of the translocon. Show that it's translating an mRNA transcript. Now draw a nascent protein emerging from the ribosome and entering the translocon. This is known as co-translational import. The protein threads through the translocon as it's synthesized. Show that the protein has an alpha helix domain and a signal sequence that binds the translocon. The signal sequence functions as an address label and directs the growing protein to the ER membrane. Label the alpha helix stop transfer sequence. It's an internal sequence that is hydrophobic, just like the signal sequence. Indicate that this is step one. The stop transfer sequence stops the transfer of the nascent peptide through the translocon. Note that stop transfer sequences are always hydrophobic transmembrane domains. In step two, Indicate that signal peptidase cleaves the signal sequence. In step three, show that this allows our stop transfer sequence to exit the translocon laterally. Even after this occurs, the ribosome continues translating until the remainder of the protein is synthesized before dissociating from the membrane. Finally, label the luminal side of the protein as NH2 which is its N-terminus, and the cytosolic end as COOH, which is its C-terminus. Now let's illustrate type 2 protein insertion. This time draw a cytosolic ribosome translating an mRNA transcript. Show that the emerging protein has an internal signal sequence, which functions as an address label, just like the terminal signal sequence in our type 1 diagram. Label the proteins N-terminus. Now show the ribosome, mRNA, translocon complex in the ER membrane. Illustrate that the internal signal sequence acts as an alpha helix domain and binds to the translocon. This transmembrane alpha helix anchors the protein in the membrane. Finally, use an arrow to show that much like the stop transfer sequence in our type 1 diagram, the internal signal sequence exits the translocon laterally in the membrane. Indicate that this time, signal peptidase does not cleave the protein. Finally, label the C-terminal and N-terminal ends. This membrane topology makes this a type 2 protein. Now let's show how type 2 proteins differ from type 3 proteins. Draw another portion of the ER membrane with a translocon embedded within it. This time, draw the protein and alpha helix domain in the translocon first. Note that so far, this diagram is identical to our type 2 diagram. Here, draw the ribosome mRNA transcript on the right side of the translocon. Now, label the emerging end of the protein as its end. So, uh, yeah, you guys get the basic idea about it right as we have already discussed all these things so i guess i'm gonna complete the proteins discussion part today because it's uh, getting too long though. yeah so this these are the basic things which we discussed about the uh, membrane transportation and how the proteins are being secreted or how the proteins are translocated within the membrane okay so after studying the feature of or the property of membrane proteins of transportation another major function which we discussed was of 
signal transduction. So all cells have specific and highly sensitive signal transducing mechanisms which have been conserved during evolution. A wide variety of stimuli act through specific protein receptors in the plasma membrane. In this we specifically discussed about the G protein coupled receptors right and the secondary messenger concept. So as the name implies G protein coupled receptors are receptors that act through a member of the guanosine nucleotide binding protein or G protein family. Three essential components define signal transduction through GPCRs. A plasma membrane receptor with seven transmembrane helical segments, a G protein that cycles between active and inactive form and an effector enzyme in the plasma membrane that is regulated by the activated G protein. An extracellular signal such as a hormone growth factor or neurotransmitter is the first messenger that activates a receptor from outside the cell. Ligand binding to the receptor forces an elastic transition that allows the receptor to interact with the G protein. The G protein then dissociates from the activated receptor and binds to the nearby effector enzyme. So instead of reading it, we are going to see how basic uh, G proteins work as we all know by now because we have discussed this that all the G proteins functions via same way, right? It's just their ligands are different. That is why there are so many different types of G proteins. But all of the G proteins have Legally, New York, similar uh, functionality. That a ligand will come and bind, a G protein will bind, and the other part of the G protein will go and bind to the effector protein. Okay. So yeah, here it goes. G protein coupled receptors, GPCRs, have central roles in many physiological functions and diseases. This diverse superfamily includes over 800 members, all sharing a common configuration, passing through the membrane seven times. GPCRs are present on all cells in the body. They pass signals from a variety of extracellular messengers to modulate intracellular pathways via the activation of G proteins and other signaling molecules. GPCRs mediate an incredible array of essential actions in the body, including smooth muscle relaxation and contraction, neurotransmission, immune regulation, and overall metabolism, and thus have enormous potential as therapeutic targets for multiple diseases. GPCRs are the largest and single most important family of drug targets in the human body. 25 to 30 percent of current drugs target GPCRs, including many of the best-selling drugs. Despite this, drug development has been encumbered by a lack of structural and mechanistic information about GPCRs and how compounds interact with them. The predominant problem is that GPCRs are too unstable to easily purify and they lose their highly organized structure and activity once removed from the cell membrane, precluding them from use in structure-based drug design. To overcome this problem, Heptaris developed a structure-based drug discovery, SBDD platform, to transform GPCR drug discovery. Heptari Star Stabilized Receptor Technology forms the backbone of its integrated SBDD platform for targeting GPCRs. Star technology involves the selection of mutations to the protein sequence, which increase thermostability and stabilize GPCRs in their natural states. Once produced, the Star GPCR can be purified from cells and still maintain its shape and function. The Star GPCR can be readily crystallized together with drug hits to determine the detailed shape of the GPCR and ligand interactions, which can reveal new binding sites and opportunities. A variety of different compounds, ligands, can be screened in silico for their ability to fit the receptor. This information facilitates the precise design of drug candidates with an ideal fit to increase selectivity and a better potential for development success. STARS can also be used to unlock the power of fragment screening for intractable GPCR targets and to help discover novel GPCR targeting antibodies which can have advantages over all drugs for some diseases. Through this technology, 
Hetaris is building an exciting pipeline of new medicines to transform treatment options for Alzheimer's disease, schizophrenia, cancer, migraine, metabolic disease, and other indications. So, uh, yeah, I guess we can complete our discussion for today till here because I have a time limit in the teams class session so i have to actually close my class in the next class that will be on tuesday we're gonna finish this and we uh, will jump into a new topic of uh, membrane potentials okay so thank you so much for your attention